I say to all of you, and even to myself, let us be patient. As the psalmist says, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That's the key to being patiently waiting for what the Lord will do. And we come on this Bible study, and we, we are certainly excited this evening to share with you what a wonderful God we serve. I want to say to you, keep, keep on keeping on. I want to say something else to you that even if, even if uh, the devil was happy about the church house, the church doors closed, yet still we open the doors in many of our homes where church are, where church first originated in the home. Even some mega churches started in the home. So all we have to do is just keep on keeping on. God's going to bring us back together. God's going to strengthen us. God's going to bless us. And I want you to keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a wonderful thing coming into the lesson. And coming in from listening to the Bible study. And not only the church service, but also the Bible study. Keep studying those books. To do your lesson. It's going to help you to learn the books of the Bible. It's going to help you to learn what God wants you to Thank you for your giving. You are growing in your giving. And the question comes, what about your spiritual life? And that's my concern. I'm going to read some stuff in the book of Isaiah, chapter, chapter, I mean, lesson number 18. What an exciting book that we find that we have today. All of them are exciting. This one here, from a spiritual and a historical point of view, a biblical historical point of view, Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, I think it is, and he, he writes this book. He is the author when we get to it later on. But first, let us pray, gracious master, we thank him and we bless you for the things you are doing in our lives. And Lord, you keep telling me, the Holy Ghost keeps speaking to me and said, murmur not, murmur not against what God is allowed to happen. Uh, when Aaron and, and, and Mary murmured against Moses, God turned on them, turned on Mary. So Lord, we are not murmuring, not complaining. And we ought to be grateful every day we get up and every night that we lay out. We say thank you, Lord. So we thank you for your goodness, and your kindness, and your mercy. Thank you for the lesson today. We ask you all of this name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lesson number 18. The book of Isaiah. The final, the final section of the Old Testament. We have now reached the final the final group of writing in the Old Testament. We have finished 22 books. And what kind of what, oh, what a journey it's been. And now the last 17 books, the books of the prophets are before us now. The first section of the Old Testament has uh, uh, 17 in numbers, filling it into a subdivision. And here how the Old Testament is broken down. First of all, five books. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, uh, the, the law, redemptive, and it's historical itself. Then you got the 12 books of the Bible, which are historical books, beginning with Joshua through Esther. These are the historical books of the Bible. Remember this now, you ought to be able to recite each one of them. The first set, five books. The second set, 12 books. I remember when I was, when I was up for ordination, I had to learn the books of the Bible, and I had to break them down in sections. And, and, and I, 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 I murmured. And so that guy, I can't learn this. But once I started to break them down in sections, I was able to memorize the books of the Bible. And you ought to do the same thing. The middle books, the middle five books, we just went through them. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. These five books are personal books, and they deal with human experience, 
human problems of the heart. And they are called the books of poetry. Here we go. Five books of the Old Testament, the, the uh, redemptive book. Then we got the 12 books of history. And then we got the five books of poetry. The last 17 books are the books of prophecy. And they fall into a like subdivision of 12 and 5 as the first 17 books. First of all, you get the first five books in that section, in that subsection. It's called the major prophets. And then the next 12 is called the minor prophet. So can I, can I just step back a little bit? Five, five books of the law, 12 books of, the, of history, five book, books of poetry, and then we have five major prophets, books, and then we have 12 books of minor prophets. And I want you to understand something. We, get, get into, we started to study the five books of the major prophets. There were only four prophets writing these books, but Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah, and he wrote the, uh, the book of uh, uh, Lamentation. So you got four writers, but you got five books. And then you got the 12 minor prophets. What, what, what does the word prophet mean? And, and this is a this is a, here, here is the point. And I want to lay this to you because it's going to help you to understand right, right where we're going into the next book. The book, the book, the word prophet, the first three letters, pro, does not mean beforehand, not here, as it does in the word proverb, provide, I'm sorry, as it does in the word provide, but it does mean in place of, say it again, Pastor, the word pro means in place of. All right? The remainder of the word prophet is from the Greek word hema, H-E-M-I, which means to speak. So here comes the definition of the book, the, the word prophet, in place of and to speak. To speak in place of. So prophet means to one who speaks in place of another. We have the example of Moses and Aaron. This is what God says to Moses. I have made you a small G-O-D. I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. But Aaron is going to speak for you. So that makes them, makes Aaron the prophet because he speaks in the place of his brother. Prophecy is not merely prediction. I'm not saying it does not mean to foretell. I just want you to get this other definition. And I like the other definition. Because I'm going to read something to you in just a little while. And that's going to cover, I'm going to cover the rest of the lesson as quickly as I possibly can. But prophecy, I like this, this definition. It means to speak in the place of. So we get the understanding of what prophet means. And it also, it gives us what prophecy is. Prophecy is not just predictions. The common idea is that prophecy is a matter of foretelling. Prophecy, in two words now, in a non-productive sense, is to declare a truth by the inspiration of God. The prophet gave you two definitions. You said it does not mean to foretell, not, not right here. Not there. It means to speak in the place of. But here, 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 again, it does not negate the fact that prophecy in, in, in a, 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 a non-productive sense means to declare a truth by the inspiration of God. And what exactly is this inspiration? We say this, we believe this, we believe this as Baptists, believe this, we believe that the, that the word of God was given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, by the covering of the Holy Ghost, that speak for God. God is the Holy Spirit. So his, his, his Spirit inspired men to write the words of the Bible. And in the old, you find that the Spirit inspired men to speak for God. 
And you are, and, and that's good. Now, but in the predictive sense, in the predictive sense, uh, it, it means the declaring of the future, which can only be directed by the inspiration of God. In the predictive sense, in the non-predictive sense, productive, productive sense, it means declaring the truth by inspiration of God. But in the predictive, when I'm predicting something, when I'm predicting what's going to happen, when I'm predicting what is happening, it is a declaring the future. And, you, and only by inspiration of God. Pastor, you mentioned it over and over again, but I don't want you to get this right. Because in this next section, it, called, it says who's qualified to be a prophet. The supreme example is that the Messiah prophet, as this, described by the Lord God in Deuteronomy 18, uh, verse 15 to 18. I just want to read this to you because this right here is so important. And I want to say this before I read this. War to you, prophet and prophetess, true prophet and true prophetess, and also war to you, the false prophet and the false prophetess that are in this world. This is what the Lord says. Now, and, and, and explain this. First of all, in Deuteronomy 18 and 15, I will raise up a prophet from among them, that run prophet with a capital P, like unto thee, and will put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That's Jesus Christ. That's why he capitalized the P. And, and then verse, the, the, the next verse says this, and it shall come to pass. That's verse, I started in verse 18, and I really wanted to start it earlier. Verse 19 said, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my word, which the prophets speak in my name, I'm going to require him because I put the word in the prophet's mouth who delivered the word to you. Amen? But the prophet, which shall presume, key word here, presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that he shall speak in the name of another small d-o-t, small g-o-d-s. Even that prophet shall not warn to you false prophet. The Bible says simply the supreme God, example, says that the Lord thy God will raise up a prophet. That's Jesus Christ. And then there are others who are prophet who God sent and put his word in them. So I would be afraid, and I am afraid now, to speak what God had not spoken to me. And, and that's why I tell, tell you all the time on the street that when I speak and preach to you, and the fact is that I'm sure about it, you can tell I'm sure about it, it's because it comes from the Lord. Because I'm afraid to speak that which is not of the Lord. Because of that scripture said, he shall surely die. The prophet was to deal, was to deal with the moral and the religious life of his own people. A prophet was always the Hebrews then, until God said, 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 said others. Amen? But we get it from the Hebrews. We get it from the Jew. Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, let me back that up. Jesus himself was a Jew. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And I want you to understand, let's get the central message of the, the book of Isaiah. Simply put, a throne or a lamb. And I think, watch this, a lamb in the midst of a throne. You remember that saying that? Saying something after the Revelation? It said, and a lamb came from under on the cross and says this, if you need somebody, I'll go. The sacrificial lamb came from under the throne of God. And if you was here today, I would ask you the question, why did it come from under the throne? The, the throne of God, the throne of God. Simply, it, was, it did not come from under. It came from God. It is God that's the sacrificial lamb. And you know who that sacrificial man is? Jesus Christ. Did I not tell you a thousand and one time that this Bible is all about Jesus Christ? 
Let me tell you a thousand and two times. The whole book is all about Jesus. And you are going to learn about the book of Isaiah. It's about Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus. There is no other way to get to God except through Jesus Christ. It don't matter to me what these other people teach us, what the other faith teaches. If it is not through Jesus Christ, it will not get to God. And I want you to put your stand. I want you to put all that you have, all that you got, into this fact. Without Christ, without Jesus the Christ, you cannot get to God. The structure of the book, there's two parts of the book of Isaiah. The judgment of God, God's government, and then there's the comfort of God, God's grace that we have in this study. So the two sections of the book of Isaiah is the judgment of God, the comfort of God. Under the judgment of God, we have that God placed judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. And also, he judged other nations. Then he gives warnings and promises. And then when you get into chapter 36 on to 39, you get the historical fact. Where, where, where I see start giving you some historical fact about the ones that God had judged. And the God of God is so good, y'all. Not only do he judge, but he also is a God of comfort. And, then, and if you want to change the word comfort, change it to God's grace. And grace is something that you get that you don't deserve. Job, under that, you got Jehovah, and you got the story of Isaac. You got the coming Messiah, hallelujah, and the final restoration and the promise of glory. Watch this now, Jeremiah. I'm sorry, Isaiah is a prophet who preaches then who prophesies then and what's coming, what's, what's about to happen, and what's going to happen long before the world, after the world ends. But you get that perspective in here. Can I, can I give you Isaiah prophetic perspective? Uh, number six, it says Isaiah was, was, was a divine, the book of Isaiah was a divine revelation concerning the prophetic parts. Well, people like to Man, people go to town. They just get in that car and go to town. And they, they sit up on that throne and they use words like prophetic. And I, I listened with the, the late pastor used to say, this is with the third year. And I listened with the third year when they use that word for, uh, prophetic. And we have to watch this now. I just read to you. War to the man and the woman who claimed to be a prophet of God. Bible simply says, if it comes true, then that man and that woman or that woman is a true prophet of God. But if it does not come true, then that prophecy is not of God. Amen? Uh, 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 ch chapter 6 of the prophetic, a uh, divine revelation of God is uh, uh, his points of this. Uh, a, under the judgment of this section. Isaiah saw things to come and to pass in his own time. He prophesied that he will come. And then while he prophesied and he's still living, those things came to pass. Amen? And then he saw something else. He saw the coming captivity by the Babylonian Empire. I read, I read my, my Bible the other day, King Zedekiah, when some men, men, uh, came from Babylon and they said that we heard you were sick and our king said come see about you and Jeremiah was so 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 taken by the fact that the king of Babylon cared about him that he showed them all the gold and silver in the king's house and in the house of God and when the prophet came to Zedekiah said what's wrong with you was either Zedekiah or Hezekiah. It might have been Hezekiah. He said, what's wrong with you? What do these people want? He said, well, they just want to see what we have. He said, you should not have showed them that. Amen? The people of God, you better be careful when you show somebody all that you have. Because they won't do anything but make them envy of you and jealous of you and will cause them that the devil can put in their heart to take what you got. Amen?
Amen? So you better be careful about that. And I'm in the next section, it says under the comfort of section, uh, the, under the section of grace, uh, Isaiah saw the coming of Christ, the anointed one. Both first and second, uh, the first chapter, chapter 7, the first time, and then the second time in chapter 11, it, and, and he gives the advent, which is what's going to happen after, in chapter 61. Then B. Bart said he saw and proclaimed finally the millennium and the new heavens and the new earth. It made me wonder right now, we call some young people the millennium. The millennium happens after the rapture. I want to understand, don't get caught up too much when you start hearing about the power of the Antichrist. When you start hearing about the forehead with six, with, with numbers in that forehead. Don't get too excited about that. Because if you are a child of God, if you are born again, and Christ come right now, which is called the rapture, he will come and get his church and take us out of this world. And all that stuff will start happening after that. The power of the enterprise and how people will be, uh, uh, will be, be, be killed and destroyed. You're going to read all of those things. How bad things will happen to God's people. But baby, what you better concern yourself with is right now. Whether you're saved or not, right now. If my advice is to you, get saved. If you're not sure, get sure. Be very sure. So if, if Jesus decided to come back, if God sends him back right now, that you're ready to meet him in the sky. And that's what the law said. That's what I'm looking for. So I should not, I should not worry myself. I should not sorry myself because all of the bad things that are happening in our world, in our country, in our state, in our city today. Yes, that coronavirus is a bad thing. And let me give you something to stand against that virus. The best thing to stand against it is the fact that you know, that you know, that you know, that without a doubt, if corona takes you down and takes you out, that you are going to go to the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And if I'm still here and Jesus come back, when I look at the sky, I'm not only going to see him, I'm going to see you coming with him. Oh, what a day. What a celebration when the Lord come back. Come on, Lord. Take me out. Take me in. I want to be ready for it. I mean, I want to go now. But when the Lord is ready, come on. I'm going to be ready then too. Watch this. And I always say this over and over again. How to remember the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah had two main provisions. The first of 39 chapters, it comes in that first section, which is the section of judgment. And then the second, 27th chapter, we find the section of grace. So the Bible had two main parts. The Old Testament, 39 books. The New Testament, 27 books. The prevailing note in the first division, remember that 39th chapter, is Isaiah, is telling the judgment of God. The prevailing note in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the first of all, the prevailing note in the Old Testament is of law. The prevailing note in the second division of Isaiah is comfort. The prevailing note in the New Testament is grace. And I back it up. The prevailing note in the first division of Isaiah is just. The prevailing note in the second part of Isaiah is common. Take the Bible now. The Old Testament is the law. The New Testament is the time of grace. Because when you open the book of the New Testament, it starts off telling you about the coming Messiah. And I like the way man said it before, the Messiah. It is the coming Messiah. I'm excited about it because I'm reading John, John the Baptist says, and God shall raise a prophet up. There he is right now. Behold the Lamb of God. I get excited when I read that book. And I just put myself there, standing in the audience with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, there comes the Lamb of God. And all of you would turn around and look at him. I would be looking too. Who is the Mashiach? Who is this Messiah? John said, there he is right there. 
Is this the way he's supposed to come? No, yes, this is the way he's supposed to come. Read the Old Testament and it explain clearly that the Messiah and how, how the Messiah comes and when he would come and why he would come. It tells us all of this. Isaiah calls on the prophetic office. Next thing, in the sixth chapter, we have a better description of God's call in the life of Isaiah. And watch how he called the call. He, he got a vision from God. That's the first thing he did. Secondly, it, in that vision, it produces conviction and confession. And then he was forgiven of his sin. And then he was cleansed of his sin. And then he heard God's call again. And God called, well, who will go for me? Remember the definition of prophets. Who will speak in the place of God? Hallelujah, somebody. He was commissioned to serve. And then, 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 then he threw this in the spirit of man. First of all, people of God, you got to get the vision and simply put, God speaks to you and he shows you. And what happened? It ought to humble you to the point that you would be convicted of your sin. And when you're convicted of your sin, you will confess your sin. And when you confess your sin, God will forgive you and you will know he forgave you. Forgave you. And then God not going to stop that. He going to clean you up. Hallelujah, somebody. How we say that? He picked me up and turned me around. He cleaned me up. And not only will he clean you up, he's going to call you into the ministry of Jesus Christ. And it's not about preaching, not, not just preaching, but witnessing. And it's hard for you to do that. And then again, it's hard for you to do that. You have to offer yourself a service. Here, my Lord, send me. I'm going to go. I'm willing to go. I'm ready to go. What are you going to do? I'm going to serve, Lord. I'm just waiting on you to commission me, to give me the authority to serve. And that's what anointing means. Anointing is just God commissioning you and giving you the authority to serve in the, to serve in the work of the Lord. That's all. You ought to keep that, people of God. Long Street, y'all keep that. Those of you who are visiting with us, that are sharing with us, keep that in your mind. And let me finish this. I can walk through it very quickly. Next thing is, Isaiah saw the birth of Christ. There's too many familiar scriptures in there. Therefore, the hand, the Lord himself, shall give you a sign. Yes, it will. And behold, this is what the sign said. A person shall conceive and bear son. And then uh, here, here comes Matthew backing them up right there. This is what Matthew said when you open the New Testament. Behold, a virgin shall be with a child and bring forth a son. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 also says something. For unto us a child is born. Luke 2 and 11 says the same thing. Unto us this day a child is born in the city of David, which is made back of him. Amen? The Savior of the world. Isaiah saw, his, Isaiah saw his death. Isaiah saw his second coming, and he also seen, help me somebody, he saw the second coming, and he saw him coming as the king of kings. And not only that, in Romans 11, 26 and 27, and so shall all of us be saved, for this is my covenant unto them, which I shall take away their sin. Oh, I don't mean, I don't have time to go into this. I don't have time to defend the fact God will never forgive his people. Did he not promise you I'll never leave you nor forsake you? He made that promise to the Jews. I will never leave you and I will never forget my people. I chose them. I chose them. Amen? It talks about the men of Paris. Twelve points right quick. I'm going to say good night to you. Uh, uh, number one, he came in loneliness. Amen? A root out of dry ground. Scripture says this, did not it not be wise? I sight, he says, Isaiah, there shall be a rule of Jesse, and, 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 and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, that's us people, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse as a branch that shall grow out of his root. And you look at Matthew 27, it says at the same time, and they spit on him. Amen? I mean, it's number two. He was despised and rejected. Matthew said they spit on him and took a reed and hit him and, 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 and told him, you are king, I'm going to take this reed and prophesy to us. Then they excuse him. Number three, he suffered for us. He was wounded for our transgression. That's in Isaiah. Peter says, uh, uh, he, who is on set, bear our sin in his own body. On a tree. That's it there. 
before, God placed him in a precarious suffering for us. The law had laid on him the iniquity of sin. God made sin. And God will punish sin. And he punished his own son. Matthew that he might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities. In number five, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his womb, his mouth. He was afflicted, and yet not he opened his mouth. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He, this, is the, this is the part where the Ethiopian, uh, the eunuch, was reading. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb that was dumped before his shoe, the Bible says he did not open his mouth. Number six, he died of felony. He was taken from prison and judged, even if he was innocent. Acts 4, 27, 28, for of a truth against our holy child, Jesus, Herod, and Paul, and the Gentile, and the people of Israel got together and crucified him. He was guiltless, that's number seven. He had done no violence. First Peter 2 and 22 says, Who did not sin? Neither did you find any God in his mouth. Number eight, my servant shall justify me. Hallelujah. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. I read that. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and then in the gift by grace which is brought upon a man, Jesus the Christ, the one who gave us the gift. Romans 3 and 25 says this, He poured out his soul unto death, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare us righteous. And I was praying the other day and said, a righteous man, the prayer of a righteous man, a fear of much, much. And God said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm not a righteous man. He said, no, you're not. But Jesus made you righteous. So, son of man, go ahead and pray as a righteous man. Because Jesus stands in your place. Did he, did he not say, ask in my name? He was numbered among transgressions. You know what that is. There were two thieves crucified with him. He was, so he was qualified as a transgressor. Then the way that he bare sins of men, who his own sin, bear our sin in his own body on a tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. Hallelujah, y'all. By whose strife we were healed. No, that, 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 that's number 12. He made intercession for transgression. And then Jesus said, Father, you forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And then they went on and down on the Lord's possession. Isaiah in the New Testament, I'm finished. The book of Isaiah is quoted over 66 times in the New Testament. Read some of the passages in there. And I like to close with the fact Isaiah talks about 66 chapters. In the Bible made a 66 book. Brother Joe, next month I'm going to be 66 years old. So I identify with the Word of God. God bless you, Lost Street. I want to say that Isaiah, first of all, last of all, one more point, there is four gospel in the New Testament. Isaiah is considered to be the fifth evangelist, and his book is considered to be the fourth, fourth the fifth gospel. Don't get confused. Don't get confused. It's because he says so much. About that. Lost Street, I want you to continue, keep it on, keep it on. I want you to learn this. Don't play with me. Most of all, don't play with God. Read your book, read your Bible, learn the Word of God. Because if you don't understand the Word of God, how can you live the Word of God? I said you'll be strong, be encouraged, be diligent, be certain. Be a servant of the Lord. Hear the call. If the Lord needs somebody, be able to say, Hear my Lord, send me. And he's calling for you right now. Send a man, he calls for you. Change your ways. Save a man, he calls for you. Get about your business and do the Lord's business. Amen. I bless you. I bless you and I bless you. 
see you Sunday morning, or hear you, you see me Sunday morning on the line. God bless you and God will keep you. Amen.